So congenital diaphragmatic hernia is, uh, is a major anomaly seen in children. It's, the incidence is about 1 in 2,500 to 5,000 live births. And the, this is a condition in which the diaphragm, the muscle that separates the chest from the abdomen, is not properly formed. So there's a defect within the diaphragm that allows organs and structures growing within the abdomen to make their way into the chest through the defect in the diaphragm. The diaphragm is actually formed from about four or five different structures that come together and knit together during development to form that one muscle. If in the process of development some of those elements are not well developed or present, then a defect occurs within the diaphragm and through that hole, structures growing within the abdomen can make their way into the chest. The call is initially received by our fetal coordinators. Some general information is obtained. We get information from her primary obstetrician or maternal fetal medicine specialist and get her record so we can have all the full information available here at the fetal center. Then as quickly as possible, we arrange for her to come and have a visit at the fetal center where she can meet with a multidisciplinary group of specialists. So patients come in and have a full day of evaluation that they get to meet with the surgeons, the neonatologists, the maternal fetal medicine specialists, the geneticists, and have extensive imaging studies with echocardiography, MRI, ultrasound. If they have not had an amniocentesis or chromosomal studies done, that can get done at that first uh, encounter as well. So would they get the full um, view, really, I mean, a total comprehensive overview of what's going on with their fetus, and then we can meet with them and talk with them at the end of that day, giving them not just a general idea of what's going on with diaphragmatic hernia, but information specifically tailored to their child and to their specific situation. So the treatment for diaphragmatic hernia typically involves taking care of the children after they're born. Most kids with diaphragmatic hernia tend to have small lungs, but fortunately the lungs are not required to function in the fetus. The fetus is getting oxygen through the placenta and being adequately well nourished uh, with the placenta. The lungs come into action and are called into action after the baby is born and has to take that first breath. And so for babies with small lungs, that's when the problem now occurs with diaphragmatic hernia. Surgery is not the primary thing we do first in diaphragmatic hernia. In fact, we wait until the child is very stable before we offer surgery. The goal is actually to allow the child to stabilize from the birthing process, be stable either on the ventilator or on ECMO, and once that's done, then we'll offer surgery to remove the contents from the chest and close that diaphragmatic hernia defect. Many times we'll make the incision in the abdomen, just below the rib cage, get into the abdomen and we're able to bring down the uh, intestinal and abdominal contents from the chest. We have a better view of the defect in the diaphragm. And if it's a small defect, we can just close it primarily by putting stitches to bring the edges together. If the defect is very large, we'll proceed by, by placing a patch to close that defect in the diaphragm. And once that's done, we'll return the contents back into the abdomen and close the abdominal wall. Option is available only for those that have a very severe form of diaphragmatic hernia. The balloon is placed through the mother's abdomen um, where the mother's, the procedure is done really under, under uh, local anesthesia with IV sedation where with the mother relatively awake or just mildly sedated, we make a, a small incision on, on the uh, abdominal wall where a small scope is passed through. It's about the size of a straw passed through the mother's abdomen, through the uterus, into the amniotic fluid. And then with a camera at the end of the scope, we're able to identify the fetal mouth, place the instrument through the mouth, pass the vocal cords, and identify the appropriate location where the balloon is then deployed and placed to completely obstruct the trachea. The goal of the balloon in the trachea then is it stops the egress of fluid from the fetal lungs and allow the lungs to continue to grow over the course of gestation. We typically leave the balloon in place until about 34 weeks of pregnancy, where we then perform a similar procedure to go back and retrieve that balloon, therefore allowing free passage of air and fluid from, from the, uh, the fetal lungs. So following fetal tracheal occlusion, the family is kept around in, in the Houston area next to a hospital because we think it's extremely important for the baby to have access to a specialized care should, should there be any cause for preterm delivery. We do not want a baby who's delivered with a balloon still in its airway who obviously will not be able to breathe. So we need to be around and available and we have a team on standby 24-7. You know, every day of the week, every hour of the day, to be ready to attend to those mothers should that occur. 
After the balloon is removed at 34 weeks, the mother can deliver at will whenever the baby is ready to come out because then there's no airway obstruction with the balloon having been removed. As soon as the baby is born, we perform the routine perinatal practices that we do for those patients. Even they're very well followed all through pregnancy, so there's close communication between the obstetricians and the fetal team and the neonatologist. So we know when she's in labor or when delivery is, is imminent so that the delivery is attended by uh, 10 neonatologists. They're present at delivery and ensure that the resuscitation starts from the very second the baby is delivered. Once the baby is delivered, promptly a breathing tube is placed in to get access to the airway and start breathing for the baby. And also a tube is placed in the stomach to enter the stomach. And then we we'll place the child on the ventilator using a well-verified and, and tested protocol of managing the care of this patient over time and escalating care as needed based on what the child requires. We have a dedicated team of surgeons and a dedicated team of neonatologists that actually take care of these patients. And we work in concert with our cardiologists who take a very close look at the heart and the heart function all through. We have a dedicated ECMO team that provides ECMO support for these patients that need to go on ECMO. And so that team works all the way through with all patients with diaphragmatic hernia, whether they're those that need to go on ECMO or not. And so over the years, we've been able to develop, develop a protocol that we actually follow through that's resulted in very you know, excellent outcome that we've published. As a result, the expertise is really kept together and we're able to all work as a team, having daily rounds on these patients where we all come together with that unified force, being able to bring up together all the ideas and thoughts from all the thought leaders in these areas to bring forth the best care for the patients. This is a hospital where the mother and the baby can get their care in the same institution. The, mother's, the mother has the baby delivered here, the baby is taken to the intensive care unit, and the mother can visit as soon as the baby is born. Unlike many centers that may see one or two or five or ten a year, we actually see a substantial amount of these patients every year, well over 20 each year. That gives us a, a very good opportunity to define what's going on with these patients and to, to make steady improvements in, in the care of these patients over time. One more important thing is we're one of the few centers in the country that can actually offer you know, fetal tracheal occlusion as a potential experimental option for those patients who have very severe diaphragmatic hernia.